Welcome to the Turkey Hunter Podcast with me, your host, Andy Galliano. In this podcast, I share with turkey hunters just like you how to have more turkeys on your hunting property and how to have more successful turkey hunts. I teach you how to do this with tips and interviews with turkey hunting pros, wildlife management tips, and entertaining turkey hunting stories. Tune in weekly as I share proven and simple strategies to help you have more success this turkey season. Make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe to receive free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews. Also, please visit and like my Facebook fan page. Go to Facebook and search I Am Turkey Hunting. And also feel free to post your turkey hunting photos from this past season and let us know where and when you killed your bird. For all of you Twitter users out there, please follow me on Twitter, where my handle is at turkeyhitman, and I will be sure to follow you back. And now, for this week's show. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. You are listening to episode 90, a best of show. And I am your host and the guy who is currently in the midst of two-a-days right now. Yeah, I'm talking about showers. It is so hot right now that I'm having a shower in the morning before work and then at night before bed. One of the main reasons being... Today, the air conditioning was out of my office, and it was a oh-so-pleasant 86 degrees in my office today. Needless to say, I think I sweated out about four pounds of fluids today, and I'm hoping that my landlord can get someone out to repair the air conditioning sometime very soon. So we are 244 days, 9 hours, 17 minutes, and 18 seconds away from opening day of spring turkey season in Alabama. So this week, I'm going to take a little bit of a break from the turkey hunting podcast, and I'm going to take the week off. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to leave you with an episode. And in fact, I am going to replay one of my favorite interviews that I've done on the Turkey Hunter podcast, and that is episode 41, my interview with JT Byrne, where we talk about fall turkey hunting with dogs. I had a blast interviewing JT for that episode, and I learned a ton of information during that interview as well. And so I want to share it with you guys again. So listen in close to JT Byrne as we're talking fall turkey hunting with dogs and i will see you guys on the other side hey i'm glad to have on the line with me tonight jt Byrne, who is very well known within the turkey hunting world especially the fall turkey hunting world of being a turkey dogger and breeding turkey dogs and jt and his dad have an operation where that's part of what they do is they breed turkey dogs. They really invented the breed for all practical purposes. And I'm going to talk to JT tonight about hunting with turkey dogs or turkey dogging, as I'm going to call it from here out. Put my little southern twist on it. JT, how are you tonight and where are you? Good, Andy. I'm doing real good. I'm in Lowry, Virginia, and it's in the central part of Virginia between One Oak and Lynchburg in a town called Bedford or a county called Bedford is our base okay. of operation. We're doing good and it's good to hear from you and hopefully we can get some myths and some answers answered and go from there. And I'm looking forward to it because as I mentioned to you before I started recording the call, I don't fall turkey hunt and like I said, it's not that I have anything against it. Some spring hunters don't want it and lobby against it and want to do away with fall turkey hunting because they want more turkeys for the spring. Personally, I think we're all in this together and I've got to be accepting of what you like to hunt and I hope that you're accepting of what I like to hunt. But the reason that I don't fall turkey hunt is because I don't have a lot of opportunity to do it. In Alabama, there's only about four or five, maybe six counties that even allow fall turkey hunting, and it is gobbler only or male turkey only. And so just for lack of opportunity, I just haven't done it. I told you earlier, too, that I have gone into the woods, and in the winter, 
when deer season is over and busted some flocks just to have some fun and call some turkeys in. And that was a lot of fun and good to interact with the turkeys that way. And I'm looking forward to this because I'm looking forward to learning more about fall turkey hunting, but really learning a lot more about turkey hunting with dogs. I absolutely love to hunt behind a dog, whether it's rabbits or squirrels or quail, upland birds, whatever. It is fascinating to me watching those dogs work. It, right. It's amazing. The, right. the, their ability, their senses, their desire to hunt and to please is incredible. That's right. And what we have in our breed of dogs, Andy, is the best way for me to describe it is a dyslexic bird dog. Because you want okay. to do everything backwards and at the end bark. And that lets you know where the birds are flushing from. And with a, mm-hmm. with a bird dog, as you know, you want him to range out in front of you. Most people want their bird dog to range 30, 40 yards. We want our dogs to range between 300 and 400 yards out from us. And they're making casts just like the bird dogs do for quail. And mm-hmm. instead of pointing, we want this dog to run in, bark, scatter the birds to the four winds. And then we want to try to get as close to that flush point as we can to set up the call back. And that's why I say that they're a dyslexic bird dog because they're doing everything backwards that the bird hunters want the dog to do. Right. That's pretty interesting. I like that description. <laughs> yeah, Being a dyslexic turkey hunter, I can relate to wanting a, a dyslexic bird dog. Yep, yep. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Well, before we jump into the meat of the interview, okay. I'm doing a new segment that is just a rapid fire question and answer. And I've got 30 questions that if you're game to play, I'll run through and ask you and you give just a short, sweet, quick answer coming back with it. And we'll run through all 30 and see how long it takes you. Right now, Brenda Valentine holds the record on this with three minutes and 42 seconds going through all 30 questions. That will be a hard one to beat, but I'll I'll try. I'm not going to make any promises, but I'll try. All right, that's that's all we can do is try. So let's see what we what we can do here. All right, I'm getting the stopwatch ready, and as soon as I start with the first question, I'm hitting start on the clock. So if you're ready, let's do it. Okay. All right. And by the way, before we get going, pass is an acceptable answer. Pass is acceptable. Okay. <laughs> it is. It is. All right. all right. All right. Here we go. How many full body turkey mounts do you own? One. How many turkeys did you kill last year? One. Diaphragm, box, pot and peg, or wing bone? All good. Wild turkey, grilled, baked, or fried? Fried. Wild turkey, on the rocks, neat, with soda, or with water? Uh, on the rocks. Do you have any grand slams? No. What is the make of your shotgun? 23 inches. All right. What what brand? What model? Rem- Remington 870D. Oh, okay. 20 gauge and then uh, tow to 410 when I'm feeling cocky. There you go. What's the favorite make of your shotgun shell for your turkeys? Uh, right now, the Winchester, number okay. five. All right. Have you ever killed a bearded hen? One. I had a feeling I knew the answer to that. When uh, Have you ever killed a Jake? Yes. All right. Would you prefer a 10-minute successful hunt on a two-year-old gobbler or a four-hour long hunt on a four-year-old with a clean miss? Mm, four-year-old. All right. Favorite camo pattern? Uh, real tree and mossy oak both. <laughs> There you go. Wild turkey legs for dinner or for the dog? No. More or less than five strikers in your turkey vest? More. 30 mile an hour winds blowing at home the last day of turkey season. Are you hunting or sleeping in? Hunting. The state you killed your last turkey in? Virginia. state you killed your first turkey in? Virginia. Sit in a blind and hunt for four hours or sh- and squeeze the trigger or run and gun for one hour and not shoot? I don't spring hunt. I knew the answer to that question. Rios or Osceolas? Osceolas. Osceolas or Easterns? Easterns. Easterns or Merriams? Easterns. All right. Public land out west or private land in the southeast? Private southeast. Okay. You may have answered this one already. Two and three quarter inch, three inch, or three and a half inch shells? Three inch. Yeah, I know you answered this one. Four, five, or four, five, six, or blended shot? Five. Field turkeys or woods turkeys? Woods. You've answered this one. Pump or automatic? Pump. Shotgun scope, rifle sight, holographic sight, or beads? Open sight beads. Rubber boots, leather boots, or snake boots? Depends on where you're hunting. Uh, Uh, Leather boots, preferably. All right. You roost a bird this afternoon, and it's pouring rain at daylight tomorrow morning. Do you hunt? Sure. Favorite place ever hunted? Bass County, Virginia. About 3 minutes, 28 seconds. Mm. You beat Brenda by 14 seconds. That's pretty doggone good. Man. All right. Well, and I knew that. 
I knew the answer to some of those, but I asked them anyway because people listening didn't necessarily know them. So That's right. That's right. that was good. I enjoyed that. I appreciate you playing along. No problem. No problem. Well, you made we've one gone. Statement. You made one statement in the opening. We did not invent the breed of dog. Okay. Okay. We we helped make them make them more accessible and more publicized to the people in the in the country, but we didn't invent dogs. Okay. All right. And I appreciate you clarifying that. And we'll talk about those dogs in just a second. Let's talk about you for another minute. Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into turkey hunting. Well, I was kind of born in it. My father was a big hunter here in Virginia, and he was a big quail hunter to, be, to begin with. But our Bob White quail population started to declining back in the 50s. He loved to hunt, and he hooked up with an old man named Andrew DeWitt, who was a fall turkey hunter and a spring turkey hunter, because Virginia had a fall season way before they had a spring season. Mm -hmm. And they would go to the mountains and try to walk up a flock of turkey. And they would find the scratching pattern in the leaves, or they'd find the tracks in the snow, or the bear hunters would tell them where they'd seen a flock on what mountain and when they saw them. And they would go try to walk them up and They'd always heard of down in eastern Virginia that people used dogs to find and flush turkeys, but they were they were a very close held commodity back in the day, and uh, mm -hmm. you had to be a family member or a really really close friend before you could get one of those dogs. So Dad had a bird dog named Don. He was an English pointer, and he started taking him along. He just figured, well, it can't hurt to take take him with you when you went. And right. they were going in the known turkey areas, and there would be grouse. Don would hold a point on grouse. Grouse would get up, and they'd get him a grouse. And then they got running into the turkeys, and Don would run in, and Don started barking, as a matter of fact. And that was the first time they'd ever had a turkey dog, so it made their success a whole lot better. So then they started mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to perpetuate that. But when I got old enough to walk and go with him in the woods, it was in the late 60s. I would get the goat, and that was when he was hunting with an old dog named Inky, and she was a plot hound. And she would bark in the day, it would be a flock of turkeys. If she barked at night, there would be a coon up tree. And he, <laughs> he, would have, he would have bet the farm on Inky. But uh, that was my humble beginnings in fall oh, turkey hunting or any any turkey hunting. He would, he would, dad would go back in the 70s, early, up into the early 80s, he would still spring turkey hunt some. But his, his love was always in the fall because he wasn't pressured to have to get back to the farm and get crops saved or get crops playing it. All that was already done and everything, and it was kind of a relaxing time for him. Yeah. That was basically how I got started in turkey hunting. And in the later years, Dad always told people, if you start fall turkey hunting or run all your other hunting, you won't ever want to do any of the rest of it. And I kind of went, what are you talking about? You just, you're just you not you're talking out of your head. Well, as I've gotten older and looked back and reflected back on his words, he was right. It, it, it's about the only hunting I want to do now. I'll go, I'll go deer hunting with a bow, and I'll mm -hmm. go with the boys on a rifle hunt just to cull the herd down because we have so many of them. Right. And they do so much crop damage. But my true love is fall turkey hunting. Yeah. So I hope I've given you some insight on, onto that. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about turkey dogging, what it's all about. Kind of walk us through what may be an ideal hunt. situation. Yeah, a hunting yeah. situation, and okay. give us kind of an idea of what states, how many states is legal in that type of thing. Uh, as far as the states legal in the mid 20s, I'm not okay. for sure exactly how many, but the last I knew it was in the mid 20s, and some of that has changed because population growth or decrease. Some some have changed, right. but somewhere in the mid 20s. When we started with Turkey Trot Acres, Pete Player read an article that. Kit Schaefer, who was well-known biologist here in the state of Virginia for the turkey program, he used to write some articles for Turkey and Turkey Hunting Magazine, and he was writing articles about fall turkey hunting with dogs. And mm. Kit lived just a few miles down the road from us, and he actually had one of our dogs. And so Kit told Pete who to get a hold of to get a dog. And Pete, has, with his growth of his lodge and us with our dogs, we kind of grew together for the notoriety of the, bringing the turkey hunting with dogs out of the closet, so to speak, and getting it opened up where more people had the opportunity to enjoy the sport to do with it. And fall turkey hunting with the dog, to me, is probably the ultimate thing to do because you get your dog is your best friend. My dogs mm -hmm. go with me just about everywhere I go here on the farm when I can. Right now, I can't let them go because the young turkeys haven't gotten where they can fly real good, and I don't want them. They don't know it's not hunting, so right. they have to they have to take a time out for a while. Yeah. And, but 
fall turkey hunting is it's a leisurely time. You're not pressured to do anything. You don't want to hunt faster than the dog can cover the territory that you're in. So the way I tell people that get up up from me or want to try to work a dog is if the dog is consistently coming in behind you, after it makes it when it's making a cast and it's coming back to check in on you mm-hmm. with you to see where you are. If that dog is coming in behind you consistently, you're walking too fast. You're going too fast. You're not giving the dog okay. a chance to hunt and to do what it's supposed to do. And as I said earlier, they're a dyslexic bird dog. So these dogs, their their average range is range is between three and four hundred yards. And that's not to say that they won't go further. I have had them go three quarters of a mile and flush a block of turkeys. They could wind them mm-hmm. or smell the track and they take off up mountain and you know you hear the dog and you just see this little black dot pick up off the top of the mountain and come flying down and you yeah. know what it is and then you try to get up there as close as you can to the flush site construct a blind for you and the dog to get in and sit there and have your togetherness and your fellowship with your other hunters the goal then is to try to call a bird back to the gun or back to the blind and sometimes it takes an hour an hour and a half and sometimes it takes four or five six hours it depends on how much the birds are fed how old the birds are and how many times they've been busted up by other predators whether it's house dogs from the neighborhood or whether it's coyotes or deer dogs or bear dogs or whatever it just right. each flock is different and my and it could be jakes and halves and it could be four-year-olds or five-year-olds in that group and the ultimate goal of me then is to target those flocks of bachelor groups of gobblers and try to flush them and try to call one back to gun. And mm-hmm. that's not taken away from the young birds, the hens and poults, and the flocks of just hens. And sometimes you'll have all three mixed, old gobblers, old hens, and young turkeys. It just depends on the season and the food source. But mm-hmm. The whole thing is it's a more relaxed hunt. You're, you're out enjoying nature. You get to see things but you don't get to see in the spring. And my favorite part is you don't have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go tramsing off in the middle of the night <laughs> to go turkey hunt. And I used to think if I wasn't in the woods by 9 o'clock in the morning that the, the day was shot. It just wasn't any need to go. But after losing my father and my brother to cancer over the years, if I get in the woods by 11:30, 12 o'clock, and can hunt till dark, I've had a good day. It just depends on how long it takes me to get the cattle fed and make sure everybody's home and nobody's out and everybody's where they're supposed to be and go from there. And then we we go out from there and let the dogs roam and do their their thing. And I don't like finding a flock of turkeys right out the truck because most time the dogs are all hyped up and they don't want to lay in the blind as well as they do if they've had about an hour or two's walking and running down. Right. And since Garmin has come out with the GPS, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread with you because my hearing isn't what it used to be. And I can look at that GPS and I can hear the dog bark and I can put a mark there and I can go to that point. And I have checked mm-hmm. myself and I've been close, but I haven't been close as I can be with GPS. So that's where technology has come in to help. Right. And, uh, so now, you mentioned something that kind of piqued my curiosity a little bit. So you're ideally you were targeting gobblers you're yes. targeting the male turkeys when in you go fall. out in the fall in the fall yep. right i mean and I, if, I've got a, if i've got a child with me or i've got a first time hunter with me and everything and i get into hens and poults or if i get into just a flock of old hens and they can be a flock of old hens can be just as challenging as a flock of old gobblers sure. in, in college but you get to hear the different vocalizations that the turkeys have sometimes it's pretty nonchalant it'll be just a flat cluck and then you just scratch in the leaves sometimes you'll get the gobbling and the strutting and the whole nine yard. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's perfectly. This fall, we busted up a flock of nine long beards in one holler where they forked one, and we caught them right in the bottom. And uh, one dog, Rose, she went in there and busted them up and did a good job, and she brought five of them by as we were walking up the road at, at a different time. She brought them in two different groups. Three came running up at one time, and two come running up. And then she went back, and she picked up every track that left there and ran it up and flushed them. And we sat mm-hmm. on those birds for four and a half hours before we heard the first bird call. Wow. And the actual flush site was over 300 yards from us when where we were standing when we first heard her barking, and he, she brought those birds to us. And what, what's so unique is a long beard will run for four or 500 yards on the ground before he'll get up. You have to really put the pressure on him to make him get up fly because okay. he, does, he doesn't want to fly. He wants to just run off and 
you'll you'll give up and then he can go on about his business and or he can get back with his buddies and go on. Mm-hmm. And where the dog is so much more efficient at running and chasing and flushing them, you get a true flush, a true scatter in 360 degrees versus a person running into them. It just kind of upsets them for a few minutes and they run off over the hollow there 150 yards. You're out of wind. You can't get them <laughs> flushed anymore and they just go on about their daily business. But when the dog does it, they do such a good job that they're going to come back to that point of flush where they were all together. They'll come back within 30 yards of where they were all together and Mm -hmm. try to regroup. And that's the beauty of the dog versus the old run into them like a madman yelling and screaming and shooting up in the air and hoping you can get them scattered. Right. Because you just don't have the leg capacity or the lung capacity to get them flushed and and busted. I mean, you do, but you don't get as an efficient flush as right. you do with a dog. And, and that's not to say that people that don't use dogs and still like to follow track out, they have their way of doing. That's great. But I just enjoy with my buddy, whichever dog it is that I've got that day. And I keep, I, we hunt normally three dogs a day. and We can change them out every three days. And I've, mm-hmm. always, got a, I've always tried to keep a puppy coming along so I, and then one or two old dogs. And they learn, the puppies learn from the old dogs. Right. Right. I hope that's giving you some insight to what, what you can do, how they can do it. Yeah, definitely. Now, when that bird's, or when that flock is busted mm-hmm. and you sit down on that flock, you don't necessarily know what birds are in that flock. So uh, any flock that you get busted, you're going to sit down and call to and try to call them back, aren't you? Right. Um, the only way is if you're fortunate, fortunate enough that the birds come flying over or come flying to the GP. And there's some telltale signs you know, that you can look at if a gliding bird, as he sets tail and flying, to tell if it's a flock of young birds or a flock of old birds, or if it's a flock of gobblers or a flock hen. And the easiest one that I always look for, and I tell anybody that's with me, I said, look the tail. And a flock of young birds, you're going to have four or five long feathers in the center of the tail, fan, mm-hmm. and then you're going to come back. And that tells you that you got an immature bird, you got young birds. If you look and it's a full fan and it's a big black body bird and a red head, that tells you you got gobblers. So mm-hmm. you got the minimum that you could have is a flock of Jake and Halves. Or you could have, and they'll mix from four year olds on down from the oldest old gobbler in the bun- in the area to the youngest gobbler in the area who get together in the winter group. So, and then if you see a blue head and a full fan, you know, that's a mature hen. And mm-hmm. if you're lucky enough to be close enough and you've got the eyes are still good enough, you see the tan versus the black on the breast feathers. And that'll tell you that it's a hen versus a gobbler. So if the turkeys don't fly over you when they flush mm-hmm. and you're not fortunate enough to be able to see what it is that the dog's flushed, you're going to sit down and call that flock just because you don't know what's in it. It could be a mixed flock or it could be all gobblers or all hens and poles, huh? You're, you're right, yep. And, you know, if you if you don't know and you know that you're in the area, the best thing to do is sit down and, and enjoy the day. I mean, if, it, mm-hmm. if you call back a bunch of young birds and you don't want to harvest a young bird, you don't have to harvest it, but you can enjoy the, the challenge of calling the birds back and seeing what you got. And they'll be there for another day. Or right. who knows, I have had young birds that take up to four hours to come back. And I've had long beards take less than an hour to come back. So you, you don't ever really know. And in, in the fall woods anymore because as these birds as these birds get more experienced and they get older, their gregariousness to get together is still there, but not as urgent. So mm-hmm. the old days where you used to hear the turkey hunters say, well, you can go out in the fall and bust up a flock of birds, and in 30 minutes they'll be back together, and you can go get your bird and come on home. There's no challenge to that. That has changed in today's, today's turkey woods. I mean, once in a while you'll still run on one of those type flocks, but it's been my experience after the deer season here in Virginia goes through and you get to fall turkey hunt in December and the January season when there's no other season going on, these birds can take three, to four hours. I don't. I don't even think about leaving three hours, even if I haven't heard anything. Right. But we're sitting there with our. We've got a special bag that we put our dogs in to help camouflage their their body. Most of our dogs are predominantly white with some black spots. But the only thing that sticks out of that bag is a is a head. And then we can build a blind. Some states you can't build a blind, but we can build a blind and we get in there. And we have our camaraderie and our fellowship, and we enjoy the day. The dogs usually go to sleep and. My my hearing's not what it used to be, and when I see my dog pick his head up and start looking in a direction, it won't be long. I'll hear a call, or I'll have a bird come walking in from that direction. So mm-hmm. you can key off the dog a lot of times what's going on in the woods. 
Yeah. Do you ever, if you don't see what's in the flock before it's busted, do you ever look around for sign to maybe try to identify some scat or anything like that to you, see what the you flock can, is? but, you know, you can definitely see the gobbler scat from the hen scat. Some people, the old timers say, a, a, gob, a flock of gobblers will scratch the base of the tree and young turkeys won't, but that's, right. you know, if there's acorns, grapes, or beech nuts, or whatever, if it's at the base of the tree and it's a young turkey, I imagine he's going to pick that grape or he's not exactly. going to pass it up for just because there's a long beard somewhere doing so. I right. don't go by a lot of those old old sign tales. Uh, mm-hmm. But you can you can scratch and see the leaves and all that. Sometimes you can look and if it's, if it's wet, damp ground, you can see if it's a hen track in there being smaller than a big long beard, but, you know, by the time our season gets here, most time these jakes are weighing 14, 15 pounds. They're pretty good sized birds, so they leave a pretty good track. Right. I'm I'm not a track expert, but that's basically I'm just out to enjoy the day with my dog and my friend fellowship when I go. Right. Yeah. Well, you breed Appalachian turkey dogs. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that came about, and tell us a little bit about the breed. What's the origin of the breed? Okay. That type of thing. As I said earlier, Dad had a friend that he hunted with, and he hunted with a corner, an English corner he had named Don. And Don was a good turkey dog, and then he worked his way up, and he heard of a man that had a plot hound, which was predominantly used for coon hunting and bear hunting around here. And he had a friend that later on, Don passed away before he could breed him, but a friend of his that hunted with him some had a dog named Hitler, and it was a pointer. And uh, Hitler liked to chase turkeys, and he whimpered at turkeys, but he didn't full-fledged bark. Mm -hmm. But he was pretty good. So they got the idea of breeding Hitler to Inky, which was the plot hound. And they got a litter of puppies out of Inky when she was like 14 years old. And they they looked a lot like a blue tick dog. Mm -hmm. And they was pretty much a sooner. They just soon lay here as they head over there. They didn't didn't do a whole (laughs) lot. And Dad would let it be known amongst the bird hunters in the county that if any of them run across a bird dog that didn't hold point and would flush quail and bark, he wanted it. And he got a mm-hmm. phone call one night from a guy and said he had him a bird dog, etc. His name was Jack. And we had kept a, one of the puppies out of Pinky and Hitler's litter and named her Sue. And they were in the pen down there together, and as nature would have it, they got tied up and we got a litter of pups. And Dad was about ready to throw the towel in, but Sue had 14 puppies out of that litter. Wow. And two of them were solid white. One of them was male, one of them was a female. And mm-hmm. I was I was like 10 years old or 11 years old, somewhere along in there. And I wanted to keep up, so Dad allowed me to keep a pup. And he had got a pointer from me to learn to bird hunt with. We still had a few covers of birds on the farm time. Mm-hmm. And I was running around here going fishing in the river and doing this, doing that. I was really too young to work on the farm that much, but I would help out what I could. But there wasn't much going on. I'd go to the river. Well, there was a few turkeys working up and down the river. One day I was back there fishing. Junior was the name of the puppy that I kept, and he took off up over the hill, and I heard him bark, and next thing I know, I see a turkey fly across the river. Well, I come back home that night, and at dinner table, I told Dad what Junior had done. Well, Junior was his dog, and that point on. I, I didn't have a dog anymore. And unless him and Don, Junior and Don one time, got a hold of a cashmere sweater that my sisters had and uh-huh. tore it up, and they became my dogs then. If they That's did right. something wrong, they were mine. But if they did something good, they were his. Uh-huh. But I digress from my conversation here. And so that fall, Dad called a bird dog trainer down in Fredericksburg named Harry Holman, and he wanted to get the corner broke, yard broke, and trained to point and all that, and Harry did that for a living. So he said, and I've got a turkey dog that I want you to break the heel. And he said, turkey dog? He said, yeah. He said, bring them on down. So he took them down, and Harry says, I keep 50 dogs here for the doctors and lawyers in Richmond and Fredericksburg. He said, the only dog I keep is a turkey dog. Dad, uh, Dad's attention perked up. Mm-hmm. And so he agreed to train Junior to heel and yard training, everything. He called and told us to come back down and get dogs. Well, about a year later, he called. He said, I've got a dog down here named that you can have out of my turkey dog. I want you to have this female. And we named her Missy. She was solid white feather. So we started breed Junior to Missy and started. That was the beginning of the line breeding of the turkey dog, that we of the breed that we have today. Okay. Um, so they were three-quarter setter, one-eighth pointer, one-eighth plot hound is what it worked out. And then we started line breeding it father to daughter to granddaughter to granddaughter to granddaughter. And mm-hmm. we still have, I think we've got 
eight units of semen left for a breeding junior in the artificial insemination. Wow. And then I had a dog named Shot. And I think I've got 18 units of semen to where I could breed 18 females to Shot. Mm-hmm. And I have a the last litter of pups I had, I bred Rose, which was Junior's second breeding AI, to Junior again. And I have an identical clone of Junior out here in the lot now. We named Jack. If you saw the picture of Junior and you saw Jack, you said you were looking at the same dog. Wow. 40 years later. That's pretty neat stuff. Yep. What is it specifically do you think that makes the Appalachian turkey dog such a good hunting dog? I think that having the hound in there for the for the nose and the winding and the trailing ability and then bird dog for the get down and get in the rush and go and mm-hmm. makes, makes them a, a real good breed of dog. And with the help of Larry Mueller, who was the dog editor for Outdoor Life, he has helped us with the line breeding and the genetic formation of these dogs and we owe a lot to him as well yeah now do these dogs make good family pets they make great house pets we raise them here the ones we keep they stay in the house till their first hunting season through and then they get introduced to the dog lot just because we can't keep all the dogs in the house we have eight dogs that we hunt do and we always have the only time that they get to come back is when we retire them and they get old and we don't want to see them in the real cold and we don't want to see them in the real hot we let them stay in the house sue she was the first puppy of ai origin she lived to be 14 and a half wow junior lived to be 18 and he hunted till he was 13 so they have a they have a right that's a long life much, much longevity in their, in, their, in their history yeah and are they you mentioned they're primarily setters so are they about the same stature and size and weight of yeah they, they're, some of them will be short hair some of them will be long hair some of them will be a mix of long and short or no happy medium hair they have a little bit of black on them, well, a lot more black than they do brown, but they'll get blue-looking picking on it, and right. once in a while, we'll get a brown dog or a lemon dog that comes out of the corner side, but predominantly, they're black and white, more white than black, but I don't care what color they are. They can, as long as they can go and flush and bark at turkeys, I could care less what color they are. Um, right. I had one solid black dog, and she was really, really good. Her name was Bill. But I didn't see where Bill had any distinct advantage of being a black dog over the black and white dog because they're running through the woods and they're just they're working the trail, and most of the time they're coming in behind the birds anyway. So they can work in behind. They have the, the speed of the hound and the bird dog, and they're, they'll weigh, you were asking about their body size, they were, they'll weigh a big one, 45, 50 pounds, unless you spay mm-hmm. them, and then if you spay them, they'll balloon up. But if you don't spay them, they, they, they're not a huge, huge dog, but they're not a small, small dog either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they make great family pet kids. They love, they just love attention. Everybody, right. most everybody that I know that has one of our dogs, it is a house pet. I can let any of the ones that I have come in the house. They they get over the initial excitement, and they'll just calm down, go over and get on their pillow and lay down, and you won't hear from them unless you have something to eat, and then they're everybody's buddy. Right. Now, once they get on the trail of, of the turkeys and they are on this scent trail following the turkeys, at what point do they bark? Do they not bark until they've actually flushed the birds? Ideally, ideally you don't want them barking until they're running into them and flushing. And okay. Because you don't want them cold trailing up to the birds. I've had some dogs that they couldn't contain themselves and they would start, and you just had to learn what each dog is doing and what's different. Now, Sue, when she first started barking, you could just forget about that being the flush site because she was she couldn't contain herself she was so excited that she might be 50 yards or 100 yards behind and just pretty much went to the last place you heard her barking before Mm. she started going in different directions and that comes with age is the most of the dogs when they're young will just run in and make the initial flush and then you'll have birds that'll run off on the ground and Mm. the old dogs learn to come in check back and start going in different directions and you'll hear them run, and then you'll hear them bark, and they'll bark when the bird gets up. Sometimes they just run off in that direction, the bird gets up before they see it, and then they don't bark. But okay. the funnest time I ever had was I was invited to go to Kansas and get into a winter flock of birds in Kansas, and there was probably 200 birds. <laughs> and we caught them out in a soybean field, so we knew better than to try to bust them out because they would see us coming. So what we did was right. we got in a riverbed and walked down the riverbed, and by the time we got to where the birds were, we would peek up over the river every now and then and see where they were. And they were working their way back to the river. And out there, that's where their their 
Cottonwood stands are, you know, mm-hmm. little oaks and all, and then the creek bed and river bed. So we were working our way down through there. And I got as close as I dared, and we looked up, and there weren't any birds in the field. So we turned the dogs loose. Down through there they went. And it took those dogs about 15 minutes to flush that flock of birds up. And then they went up and flew out into that prairie grass and squatted down. And we took uh-huh. the dogs up there and started busting them again. And Sue and, and Sam, my friend Sam, dog Duke, they were gone for another 30 minutes. You hear them bark, you see a bird pitch up and go, pitch up and go. And we got them back, sat down, and we're successful in calling birds back. And that was a lot of fun. Wow. It was the dogs, they just, like, what are we supposed to do? Oh, I bet they were going crazy with that number of birds. <laughs> yeah. They didn't know what to think. Yeah. And that was, you know, Longbeard, Jake, Jimmy, Ken, everybody all mixed together. So. Right. Yeah. Now, in a situation like that, are you sitting down at the first bust site? Initially, yeah. Okay. You're going to have birds come back into there. And most of the time, the first flush site is where you want to be. Now, if the old hen comes in, and this is another place where the dog comes in great, is when you flush a flock of turkeys and it's a young flock and the old hen comes in and starts the old hen assembly yelp, mm-hmm. I can slip the dog out, get it out, let her hear it, send it, they'll go out flush her off because those birds have heard her talking to them ever since they were in the egg. Mm-hmm. So they know her and her tones and her voice mm-hmm. over somebody that's trying to do it on a diaphragm or slate or anything like that. Not saying that you can't call them away from them, but it's a whole lot easier if you level the playing field by running the old hen off. And then right. you've got a whole new ball game. And you can you can stay there and still enjoy the afternoon or the morning hunt or whatever it is going on. Yeah. And in the in the flocks of fall long beards, I started telling and I don't think I finished this one earlier in the interview. We flushed that flock of nine long beards and rose took them in three, four different directions, and we got in there and found them scratching and sat down. And like I said, those long beards will run on the ground forever before they fly. You've really got to put pressure on them. And mm-hmm. we sat there for four hours before anything happened. And I took a decoy, an old Subaflex decoy I had with me, and I painted the head just a brilliant bright red, set that out about 30 yards from us. And a turkey started calling in front of us, and then one started calling directly behind us. And there was a lot of running cedar in this poplar holler. Mm-hmm. And that bird was closer behind us than the one that was in front of us. And I just kept plucking and gobbler yelping to him. And he came on down, and he was coming just in a dead trot because the evening, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the sun was starting to get down. And he come running over the ridge, and he stopped. And when he stopped, the sun was on him. And he looked down that holler, and he saw that red-headed decoy, and he just mm-hmm. blew up and struck. And he come the next 125 yards in full strut and gobble. About every five steps, he just turned loose gobble. Wow. And the sun was on him, and it was one of the prettiest sights you'd ever want to see. And that was on, on, on January day. Mm-hmm. And when he was harvested, he had an inch and a quarter spur. Ten, wow. Ten and a half inch beard and weighed 19 and a half pounds. Wow. That's so a dang good turkey. He was, he was a trophy by anybody's standard. No doubt. Do you typically use decoys in a fall? Just when I know that I've got a flock of long beards. Okay. Sometimes they'll just do a walk by a cluck, just a flat cluck and a flat yelp and once in a while a gobble. But if they don't see one of their buddies down there, out there, they will walk on by and say, the freight train's going this way. But if you've got, oh, really? if you've got a decoy like that, you know, and that feather flex is light, folds up real easy. If you were fortunate enough to harvest a bird, one of the, one of his running buddies out of the flock, what we'll do is we'll give us a, a fork and stick or two and push it in the ground and balance that bird on its breast and let the wings lay down just a little bit and then take another fork and stick and prop the head up and let rigor more set in and use a harvested bird for a decoy. And they'll come running right to it. Yeah. One of the most memorable hunts was the last hunt that my father was able to go with us on. We had a flock of six long beards here on the farm. And I was seeing them about every two or three days while I was feeding cows. I told him, I said, we ought to go off those long beards. Oh, I've got to go to the bank. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I said, well, go do that. We'll go flush this flock of birds. When you get done, you just call me, and I'll tell you where we're at. I'll come get you. And, uh, yeah. He said, okay. And now, Dad was, he was probably 83 when this happened. And he had bouts with some cancer and been through some things. And he couldn't stay warm. The circulation wasn't the greatest. But it was a rather warm December day. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got in there about 1 o'clock, and we flushed birds around 1030 that morning. And he came in and sat down. We made the blind up big enough for him. We had two dogs in the blind. And he sat there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Not the first bird he called. That said a word. 
and I looked through the woods, and I saw a gobbler coming off the hill on the other side there, about 300 yards. And I told him, Dad, there's a bird coming from out front of him. Get up here and get ready. Okay. And he get down in the holler and never said a word. The whole time, I'd just been clucking and gobbler yelping every 15, 20 minutes on a sleigh call. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, we heard, <laughs> sound like I heard an elephant coming. And I said, man, it can't be just that one bird. Well, sure enough, it wasn't. It was four of those long beards that got together in the bottom of that holler and was coming up. And we had that decoy set up. And my father lost his right eye in a freak accident in 87 or 88, I think, mm-hmm. with a nail come flying back when he was driving it in the barn and he cut the cornea and he couldn't do a cornea transplant. So he lost his vision in his right eye. Wow. And he had a crossover stock put on his shotgun. So his, yeah. depth, his depth perception wasn't real good. And so I had set up this decoy and told him where the decoy was. I said, Dad, get on the decoy. The birds will, the birds will come up right at the decoy. And he got twisted around there and got set up on the decoy. And he says, I see him. I said, all right, wait a minute. Let me get him to separate. Man, the decoy was about 25 yards from us. And I clucked and one stepped off to the side. And he turned it loose down there. And that hit the ground. And the other four just slipped right up in there, sat right back down, and was looking at the one laying there kicking. Mm-hmm. And... My friend Sam was sitting on my left. I told him to pick one out and shoot. And he picked one out on the left side and shot. And the other three flew right up in there and sat right back there. And <laughs> I, I clucked and called again. And I was looking at their two buddies. And I picked out one and shot. And this all happened in less time than I'm talking about. And went down there. We had two two-year-olds and a three-year-old. Wow. And the others stood there when we got up and the dogs ran them off. And that was a that was probably the best day I can ever remember being in the woods and the most memorable day I can remember ever being in the woods with my father. Wow. That's a heck of a story. Usually in the at the end of every interview I do I ask someone to tell us about the most recent successful turkey hunt that they've been on and the one or two things that made that hunt a success. That answers that question for me because <laughs> that story is so good that I just don't know how that could be topped. It's, but what, it was a red letter day. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. That's awesome. But I, I have a follow-up question. Actually, I have a couple of follow-up questions about that. Okay. Is it often that you'll get the opportunity to, to take more than one bird out of a, a flock like that once you've got them busted and they've come in? Yes. Of gobblers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then... That's what's so neat about hunting with a dog. That dog flushes those birds in every imaginable direction of the compass, okay? Mm-hmm. They're not all coming back from the same direction. So okay. you can harvest a bird, you can blow a bird, you know, miss a bird, do whatever. You let the dog out when that happens because they're so excited when the gun goes off most of the time. Right. Mm-hmm. And they'll run a big circle around and they'll bust any birds that are close. And then you just sit back down and you've got a new game. Wow. And... That's the beauty of the fall bird versus the spring, because if you've called up that bird and missed him, you're done for the day. You've got to go find another game to play. Mm -hmm. But in the fall, you still got a good game. You can miss as many as you want. That's pretty interesting. I might, I might actually be good at fall hunting then. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just tell me what what shell company you use if you're that if you're that way, so I can buy stock in it. A uh, buddy of mine this year at the NWTF convention in February in Nashville, he yep. taught me into buying three boxes of shells. Uh-huh. Well, I was buying two boxes for me, and I thought I was buying him a box because he didn't have any cash. You know, one of those deals, hey, buy these buy yeah. three boxes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I get these three boxes of shells. And I'm walking around the convention center in Nashville for about 30 minutes, toting this five pounds of shotgun shells around with me. And I looked at him and I said, here, carry these. One of these boxes is yours. You carry this bag for a little while. He looked at me and said, I don't need any shotgun shells. I said, why'd you tell me to buy three boxes? He said, because I know you like to shoot and you like to miss. (laughs) (laughs) So I know better now. I have to ask him why he wants three boxes of shells next time. (laughs) All three of those were for me. Well, tell me, what what was it about that hunt that made it a success? Was it just the, the patience and the quality of the flush you got on that flock? What It was the flush, okay, that we got on those birds that made it so that it would ultimately come together. That they went in different directions, and they came back up the holler 
and got together right below us, but they knew they weren't at the specific flush site. And they mm-hmm. heard they heard another bird calling up at the specific flush site. And then they could see a bird silhouetted. But what right. what made the, the hunt was the anticipation of those birds coming back. The fellowship of spending time with my father and my friend and the dogs and the blind and everything. And it was a nice, warm December day. Mm-hmm. And then getting to, to watch him harvest the bird and... That was that was quite an accomplishment. But when I hear my dogs bark and I see turkeys flying off the side of the ridge of the mountain or out of the woods in the flatlands, mm-hmm. and I know that they flush turkeys or I can hear the turkeys alarm putting and the dogs barking and the wings flapping, I get a sense of accomplishment from that. And harvesting a bird is kind of anticlimactic to me right? because the hunt's over once I've harvested that bird. Mm -hmm. But getting to see the dogs do what they are bred to do and knowing that they're capable of doing it at any time, that's the satisfaction of the hunt to me. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's what we all should be enjoying in the hunt, no matter what type of hunt it is that we do. You know, the 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 actual harvesting the animal is is secondary. It's Mm anticlimactic. To me, mm-hmm. um, you get to see so much neat stuff in the woods if you just open your eyes. And right. so many people today are so technological bound that they don't get to see what's going on around them because they're worried about what's being done on Facebook or what's being done on who's sending me a, a text or any of that stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I refuse to take anybody that plays on an electronic device while we're in the woods. Mm-hmm. I'll take them once, and if they want to go again, I make them leave their electronic device at home. There you go. We're out there to enjoy nature, and we're out there to enjoy what we see. I mean, I don't know. I know of two places that you can go and see a bear walk through and through just about any time you want. That's in Alaska and Maine and probably Canada. But it's kind of neat, and you're sitting in a turkey blind, and you look, and there's a black bear walking 200 yards down the holler feeding, working its way up towards you. Or, right. or a herd of deer coming through, or even a, just a chipmunk. Full of, got his jaws packed out and looks his head three mm-hmm. times his body size and he's got his <laughs> stash going to bury it. Those are yeah. things to me that that's more what I get to see with the fall hunt than I do if you're after the spring hunt. The spring hunt, it's exciting, but you've got to be quiet. You've got to be up before the crack of dawn in most cases to get to the woods, to get in position so that you don't spook the bird trying to get to the place. And uh, mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about all that in the fall. Once the woods quieted down from where the dogs come from, you can see nature intermingling and interacting. Right. So it's unique in its own way. And I don't begrudge people that spring turkey hunt. I hope people don't begrudge me from my fall turkey hunt. Yep. I hope the same. It's all good. Same. It's all good. That's right. We're all in this together, and if if we can get divided, that's where the antis want us. Yep. yep. And know they can pick us off that way. So no doubt about it. If somebody wanted to hunt in the fall with turkey dogs, is there a place that they can go to do something like that or learn more about yes, opportunities uh, to do that? There's one place in New York State, Turkey Trot Acres, owned by my friend Pete Clare. They can get more information. I think you go to turkeytrotacres.com and you can you can get more information there. He's the only commercial place that my father gave to use our dogs at. We right. have we have a breeding clause contract that and Pete's the only place that you can commercially use the dogs. Okay. All right. And, and I'll, they, I'll they can call us and they can go for more information. I think there's a wild turkey dog. Facebook page, and I think my wife has a Facebook page. I don't computer, so I can't tell you. I think she has one, uh, Burn Turkey Dogs, and get some information there. And that's B-Y-R-N-E, Turkey Dogs. And I think there's an American Wild Turkey Dog page, a guy named John Freedies runs. Uh, I'm not sure. Right. Wild Turkey Hunting Dog Association. So, okay. And I'll put, I'll tell you what I'll do. On my website in the show notes for this show, I'll put the link for the American Wild Turkey Hunting Dog Association where somebody can go and learn yep. more about yep. hunting with the dogs. And then I'll put up Turkey Trot Acres yep. website and, as well. And we don't have the only breed of turkey dog now. Let me clarify that to you. I've got a lot of friends that have droppers, which are pointer setter crossed or Britney's crossed or Britney's straight and mm-hmm. they're more of a renegade of the breed and they do great we're we're not the only people that have a turkey dog the only what we have managed to do is give notoriety to the sport 
Right. But by no means are we saying that we have the only turkey dogs they are, because we don't. Right. Yeah. We're probably the most widely known in the turkey dog breeding because it was always held so close and so tight, nobody wanted anybody to know about it. And I don't mind telling anybody or sharing ideas or tricks of the trade with anybody because that's what it's about. Right. I'm a firm believer in that. That's why I do the show every week. So, Well, tell us about your breeding operation and how someone can get in touch with you if they want to buy one of your dogs or just learn more about sport. Like I said, my wife, she has a Facebook page for the dogs, Burn Turkey Dog, and it's B-Y-R-N-E. You can go on there, and Mm -hmm. she can friend you, and you can call, or I can give you my phone number, and you can call, and we'll talk about it anytime you want. My phone number is 540-875-7704. If you don't get a hold of me, you can leave a message, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. We generally breed one female a year, and we we keep a pup or two for ourselves, and then we sell the rest at a negotiated price, and we're not a puppy mill. It mm-hmm. could be it could be two, three, even four years before you'll hear from it. But you can always call and check and see where you are on the list or if your situation's changed, if your phone number changes. Because I have no way of knowing that your phone number changed. But you know, we'll be glad to talk to anybody anytime about turkey dogs and turkey dog hunting. Okay. Well, fantastic. JT, I appreciate you taking so much time this evening to talk to me. I know at least when it comes to turkey hunting, I can talk all day about it and... <laughs> So I I tend to run long a little bit every now and again, but I really appreciate you taking your evening and talking to me. My pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. yeah. I I learned a great deal. That's something that from the very first time I heard about it, it was always intriguing to me. Right. And you said something about about being at the NWTF convention. I was there this year thinking that they were going to do a turkey dog seminar. And this year was the one year they didn't have it on the program. The previous two or three years, my friend Scott Bayshore had done a, him and Steve Hickoff had done fall turkey hunt seminars at at the NWTF. And I don't know if they're going to have one this year or not. I yeah. know several people were disappointed that it didn't happen that are on the board of directors, and they said they were going to see if they couldn't rectify that. I don't know if that'll yeah. happen or not. Well, good. Well, I'll certainly send an email over there and put a, a little bug in Karen Lee's ear yeah. about adding that to the program because not that she really gives two hoots as to what I think, but right. if enough people do it, then sure. they'll be a lot more apt to listen. Well, JT, thank you again. I really appreciate you taking so much time with us this evening, and I learned a great deal. I'm sure everyone else listening to the show learned a lot as well, and there's so much history behind hunting with turkey dogs that I think that anybody that's interested in it, really, you you can find a lot of information out there about it, but if you really want to learn about it, I think people are going to have to get in touch with folks like you and some of the others that have that have really been doing it for a while and you know i think turkey trot acres would be a good good place for somebody to start if they wanted to try one out yep, yep, try yep. hunt like that out i've enjoyed talking to you and your audience tonight i hope i've enlightened some people and sparked some interest in some but i've enjoyed it and you know give it a try it's a whole untapped resource of turkey hunting that you never knew was there yeah it's just as exciting in the fall as it is in the spring only uh, there's a whole lot of more the vocalization goes on right right well that's awesome thank you again jt and i will be in touch with you i'd like to stay in touch with you and maybe get you on the show to do another interview in the not too terribly distant future and sure. talk a little more fall hunting with you and sure. it's been, enjoy been, doing it. yeah, enjoy been it. a great yeah a great deal of fun for me as well so i appreciate that and i hope you have a great night and i will talk to you later on okay good night good all evening. right thank you mm-hmm. goodbye Bye. okay so i hope that you guys enjoyed the replay of the interview with jt i always enjoy hunting behind dogs And I always enjoy turkey hunting. And so that, to me, is combining two of my favorite things to do. I did not take JT up on his offer to turkey hunt with him last year. But I need to reach out to him and see if maybe that offer is still open for me to come up there this winter. All right. That is all that I have for you guys this week. We will have a new episode next week. So be sure to tune in for that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. I know that you have choices. I appreciate you spending your time with us. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. You were just listening to the Turkey Hunter podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please go on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. 
And make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe for free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews to help you have a more successful turkey season. And stay tuned for upcoming episodes on hunting afternoon birds, how to film your hunt, and the breeding cycle of hens, as well as some guest interviews. Thanks again for listening. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. See you next week.